So uh, it's good to be here with an uh, esteemed group of VCs. You know, that everyone knows them, so everyone's going to them for funding. So uh, no introductions necessary, right? So, um, so today I'm going to talk about the, the VC landscape, the startup landscape, uh, the past, the present, and the future of uh, startup funding and just startups in, in Singapore. Uh, and these guys are definitely in the know. Um, so just to set the context, right? Uh, so I, I, I wrote a, a report, right, recently, uh, casting like doom and gloom on, on the VC landscape uh, in Asia. How uh, in the past year, right, uh, VC funding has, in terms of volume and, and uh, in terms of just uh, money invested, has been declining, especially in the past year compared to uh, what we've seen in the past the two years preceding that. So yeah, so just to start off on that, like. I, is it really that bad? Um, does the data, is the data rubbish? You know, uh, what's really happening, been happening in the past year? So here, and maybe your thoughts. Or, yeah. So I did read that article. <laughs> and it's, first of all, I would qualify by saying that data at best yeah. in this market is hard to get, yeah. right? So absolutely good effort in trying to quantify what's happening. And we agree with you that volumes have well, the number of transactions have actually gone down. Yeah. But we have our own data. Yeah. Uh, what we feel is that actually that's a good thing because you're taking the signal stronger, you're taking the noise down. And we, what was interesting in the report, which we concur with you, was that the average seed found, the founding round is about now about half a million. Right. Whereas about a year or two ago, it was roughly about 250. Yeah. Right? So what, what you see about that is, I think what you're seeing is a couple of successful entrepreneurs coming back. They're raising straight off the bat a million dollar seed round. You know, KFIT did three million dollars, like a mega seed. Okay. We still count that as a seed round because that's a confidence in terms of um, you know stage of the business. And then the rest of the people who are raising smaller 250 checks kind of round up, and that's why we're getting to 500. That's the, from a gut feel what we're seeing, and we think that's a good thing because we want to see the best companies get funded at a good amount of runway. Mm -hmm. So a lot of seed investors are getting more selective. And you see new players like Cocoon Capital, you see new players like Seed Plus. Uh, they are writing checks when they write it, they want to write it uh, well. So what does it mean for the people who maybe just came out of university? That's okay because we're also seeing a tremendous number of accelerators coming out. So you see, uh, I think Alex um, Lin over at Info, uh, SG Innovate now, right. we call it, uh, wrote a great blog post about having so many accelerators in Singapore. You see a lot of accelerators, incubators in Thailand and mm -hmm. in Indonesia. So there are many different ways of raising a uh, different amount of money depending on your competency and experience levels. And that does well for us as Series A, guys, because we want to see the best companies get financed uh, with the best runway so that they have the best chance yeah. of being successful. So I like and don't think it's <laughs> doom and gloom. Yeah. I think one thing, to, one thing to add is that I, for all the founders in the room, some of these stats are maybe interesting for us as investors um, to kind of like see the macro themes. But as investors, you shouldn't pay too much attention. It is not about uh, this guy will say winter is coming and this guy say no, it's spring and that, will go, that guy will say no, it's summer. You shouldn't focus on that. You focus on building a business and you focus on building value. And you'll see that in whatever environment, um, the valuable companies, the guys that really build something unique will get funded. And within Sequoia, actually at the global level, the experience is that in the, in the so-called downturns, the best companies have been created, right? So don't focus too much on, on whether it's a gloomy article or a positive article for that matter. Um, just keep your heads down and build and that's what, where value will come from. Right, basically if you are a great startup, great founder, uh, it shouldn't matter, right, at, at when, um, whether the, the funding landscape is great or whether it's not, right? Uh, because great companies will definitely get founded, yes, right? Yes, theoretically yeah. true. Yeah. But in actually, but that never been the, the case. Yeah. Uh, when the market is very hot, founder will ask for crazy valuation. And uh, so as an investor, if you are disciplined, you will try not to get caught in that uh, bubble. And when the times are really bad, founders are desperate. And uh, investors, uh, naturally, good one will still continue. The bad one will all run away. Yeah. So naturally, the founders will get less uh, opportunity to raise money. So that's always the kind of the tension, the supply and demand situations. 
I mean, you look at uh, Asia, you look at it, China 12 months ago, that was the problem they had. India today is all is completely wiped out in the industry speaking. Mm. Southeast Asia, of course, uh, we have certain pockets of such problem. Indonesia have a showing sign that it's going to go towards Indo Indonesia, mm. India direction, whereby there's a bit of bubble going on. Mm. Uh, so, so generally, I agree that when we talk to founders, we try to um, remind them that you are building a company for seven, ten years. Mm. Don't try to ask for that short-term, uh, you know, instant gratification or valuation. Mm. And we have to tell them that, please, uh, you need to look into seven years from now, are you a billion dollar? So today, if 20 million or 10 million, what's the difference? Uh, if you are one, uh, a billion dollar in seven years' time, then 20 million valuation is not going to make a difference in, in what you're trying to do here. So that, that's something that is hard to say, uh, hard to execute for founders. But then uh, generally, when times are bad, founders are listening better. But times are good, they usually don't listen very well. Yeah, I mean, when times are bad, all the, the bad founders, they just dis disappear, right? And I guess, uh, so right now, what, what I, uh, I guess what you're saying is that for C-stage investors, um, they're investing a lot more in terms of uh, uh, the size of the round in, in worthy founders. Um, because that gives them more one way to prove their product and I mean one, one flip side to this is yeah. that I'm seeing that the founders themselves who are trying to get those fundings are a lot more contextual and they're a lot more knowledgeable right so on one point you might have investors being a lot more uh, careful about the fund deployment and and liquidity deployment but on the other end you see a lot more founders understanding that yes their product might not be ready for prime time seed. And they, those cadences are actually changing on both fronts when I look at what's happening in Southeast Asia and even Asia specifically. In Korea, specific, uh, in Korea as, as he would say, they will go in the, in, into an accelerator, slow down their pace of funding and their overall idea of how they want to build out the business, and then find out and understand that through the market and compared to the market, I am ready and I am not ready. Those things are a lot, becoming a lot more uh, developed, I, I would say. It's, it's like the, it, the whole thing is starting to silo in the same way that you see in a mature ecosystem, right? right? So we were just joking backstage, like we've all been journeymen. Of course, Keylock is... <laughs> <laughs> I was covering Vertex as a banker at 26 years old, yeah. uh, in .com 1.0. We've seen the cycle, right? And the cycle got reboot in 2010. And it had to be reboot in a certain way, so we cannot criticize or make comment as to whether there was overfunding on the seed level or whatever. Let's talk about what we have today. We have very siloed seed guys, we have very siloed A guys, we have very siloed uh, B, and then hopefully you know you convince KKR to give you half a billion dollars. What do you mean siloed? Siloed as in like for us, we do A, if we see a good seed team, we pass it on. We really do, right? I mean that's just our firm. And we maintain great relations with the seed people. We know their flavors, we kind of pass the buck on and we hope to get the ball back. And okay, we also have um, you know, as intimate a conversation with the B people and then we move forward. So the but question are, is sort of you, like, would you agree evolving? that those, that, those uh, that the borders are blurring? Because I, I, I felt that two, year, two years ago, three years ago, when it was just uh, the, the TIS incubators and it was either a 600K round or anything else, those silos were very strong. Yeah. But now like we do A, B, C, whatever. You do A, B, C, D, but, but, but E, F, G, because it's Sequoia. But sometimes C. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you also see a lot of the TIS guys raise new funds and now can do rounds from 500K to 3 million. But so they also tell people they don't want to do C anymore. They're moving into A. I almost feel like they say that, right? And then like you look at Jungle, they sort of spawn Seed Plus and go, right, Michael Smith, you do that. And I think we're not at the time where we're seeing um, stage agnostic billion dollar funds. Right? I mean, Kilo, maybe you can comment no, on no, that. No, I, I agree again. I mean, everybody has different skill set. If you are good in A, you're not necessarily good in C. I always remind our people, you know, the table tennis and tennis looks alike. Huh? <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually all about hitting a ball across the net, right? But then, if you are a world-class table tennis player, doesn't mean you are a world-class tennis player. So, I think I agree again. I mean, the, if you are good in A, you're good in A. Uh, C, you pass on to somebody else. Somebody else is better than C, and then do the C. I you better you yeah, uh, yeah. see round, you do see round. That's matter. Everybody have their yeah. own skills. I guess with Jungle, it's like they, they're siloing within their, their, their firm, yeah. right? C plus. So that's a good thing, yeah. right? So they, they got the right sort of table tennis players to play table tennis. Yep. And I think the Jungle guys with, you know, the few people, they, they're also moving there. 
you look at the evolution of what we did, we came in to solve the Series A problem three years ago. In fact, that's what we were talking about. Uh, there is no Series A problem, in my opinion. Now, there's 600 million last I checked. Now, the question to what we're talking about today is, is there, because is the landscape evolving, right? Is there a Series B problem? Now, the first thing I would say is, I don't think there's a seed problem. So I think the first thing I wanted to say is, I think the seed is getting better because people are putting real money, their own money, um, you know, the seed and angel investors are experienced operators. They believe in the region, they're coming to this region and they're doing it and they're being more selective. And they also look at what all the Series A guys want to invest in and if you're kind of like not in that pattern, yeah. then they're, they're going to maybe not want to invest in you unless they really believe in it. So the, 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 the selectivity in seed I think is a good thing. Now the question is, is B going to be, um, you know, built out. I think it is currently being built out at this point of time. Yeah, so how has, uh, so we mentioned how the, the landscape's evolving, you know, you mentioned that there's no longer a Series A crunch, so how has each of your firms evolved your, your change of approach in, in just this year, right? So, like, how's Rakuten doing things differently? How's sure. Sequoia? I yeah. mean, for, for Rakuten, we've, we've remain pretty consistent. Um, just going back to kind of the Series A, Series B discussion, we haven't looked at it specifically in that perspective. We have, what we have done is focused on verticals that we want to invest in. Yeah. So if you look at ad tech verticals, and if you want to build out, for example, a very, very proper DSP or an SSP, the capital requirements to build that out properly are very different from building out a carousel, right? So because of that, our Series A could be at just as well as 10 million US dollars where we did a $1 million Singapore, uh, you know, a, a, a seed round with carousel. So in that perspective, you know, I think for us, we've tried to main, remain consistent and true to the verticals we understand and then push into it so that at least we can further support the companies that we believe in. Uh, for the past four years, um, our stable of portfolios has not gone over 20 companies and that's been very deliberate. We've actually del used that liquidity to redistribute into those very companies. And I believe that's been able to give the companies a lot more focus and a lot more time to think about how they want to meaningfully build out their business. Simon, can I ask one, one question that is not directly related, but I'm very interested in. We can talk about all this, the, the funds here, like in Jungle and Seed Post was mentioned and ourselves, etc. But there's a lot of money coming in from Japan and specifically China. Yeah. You're obviously slightly different coming from a, from a corporate venture fund, if you like, and from China. What's your view on uh, outside money coming into the region and how the, what the role is in the ecosystem? I mean, for me, any money that comes into Southeast Asia is a good thing. Money, even though we call it liquidity, is really hard to move from one place to another. If, we're, if there's people committed to enough to actually put on resources and put in money into our region, please be my guest because any, like having a sustained exuberance in the marketplace will definitely bring better talent, better ideas, and overall just a, a, a better ecosystem to build out the next great company. It's great in terms of exits, right, with, you know, the Chinese giants coming in and just investing in, in tech companies and starting ventures and starting accelerators. I guess it, it just props up the entire landscape. Would you say that's the case? Or? Yeah, for me, I'm just looking at it meats and potatoes. If there is money to be actually utilized to build your business as a founder, yeah. I say, please be my guest. I think it, with, with, those, with, with that kind of environment, we have the ability to build out even more sustainable business structures that were not possible before. Right? There, can't, there shouldn't be only one Gojek. There could be three or four if Indonesia has its way. There definitely could be more than um, Grab and Gojek. There we, go. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Um, maybe to that point, uh, if you look at the narrative over the past two or three years, it's been, can Southeast Asia as a region generate billion dollar companies. We don't talk about that anymore. Yeah. And I think for us as a firm, what we want to do is we need to make sure that entrepreneurs who start out in one country can regionalize. So actually as a firm, we now have a heavy emphasis on operational excellence. And almost 40% of our team are operational people. So we are high touch, high conviction. Once we sit on the board, uh, we really leverage into getting your C-level suite going, your growth hacking being measured, and operational variance analysis on your board level to prepare yourself uh, for the Series B round. Because our heritage in some way has been being backed by a private equity group, so part of us knows what it takes to raise that B round. And our job as the A guys 
are to get you to the next round. That's our single job, right? You focus on the product, you focus on all the other things. We get you in the right shape for the B round because we know the B round is coming. So uh, you know, B Capital just put in uh, a fair amount of money into CXA. Uh, that's a heavy slog. We spend a lot of time with Rosnin and the crew uh, getting them ready to that stage. And then when we go out, we go out in force. She did a very successful fundraise. And we, want, we, we think that's our KPI. We need to replicate that more for our portfolio companies. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned CXA because they come across as a very specialized startup in a way. Right? You need a certain level of expertise and, and industry knowledge to be able to tackle that space. So do you see that as like the wave of the future? Do you see more startups um, that are just very deep tech focused, very you know, AI driven, right? That, that's, that's what everyone's saying about being a next wave. So, do you see a nature of startups changing I in, think, in this region? I think you need to distinguish between two things that yeah. you just mentioned there. One is horizontal versus vertical, and second is deep tech versus not. Yeah. And those are two separate conversations. Um, the, the first one is there's always a debate, and initially when you look at the, where the large market cap is being created, it's all the, the system of records and the key stakeholders of a business. You got Salesforce for CRM, you got Workday and PeopleSoft for, for, uh, for, your, for your HR and for your employees, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with Viva and other guys, you start seeing a lot of market cap being created in, uh, in, 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 in vertical place. So that's a separate question and uh, one industry in the case of, of CXA. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question is you can do that, but if that, if that niche is smaller, if that vertical is smaller, you have to be deeper into that company. You can't be as superficial, but people need to use it more deeply, you need to engage more strongly, you need to be able to charge more for it to ultimately yeah. drive the revenue growth that you, that you want to, to build a larger business. So there's, that's a different conversation. The second conversation you say is, are we gonna see more deep tech? And I think if you look at the, at the US versus, versus India, where, where obviously we do a lot, uh, and where you see very, very strong engineers coming from the IITs, many of them go to the US, uh, spend time there, either in, in, in Stanford or otherwise on, on, on top of their IIT education, work for Amazon, work for Google, work for Facebook, then come back, you start seeing real deep tech, uh, both in consumer companies and people building enterprise companies. What you see in Southeast Asia with, with the, the, the growth of the region being driven by the increase in GDP and disposable income and an emerging middle class, et cetera, um, most of it is consumer, right? It's B2C and, uh, and, and there's less engineering talent. The interesting dynamic right now is I'm starting to see more SaaS companies. I'm starting to see more B2B in the last two years. Yeah. Um, and you start seeing more people from, um, uh, fr from the US actually coming in. Right. I, uh, in the summer, I actually spent time uh, in, uh, at a session that um, Monks Hill organized at 500 Startups in, in Silicon Valley. And it was, the topic was Southeast Asia. And I found out about it the day before. I was asked to join a panel. I look in the room, there's 300 people. And most of them had some sort of relationship with Southeast Asia. And the theme, not just from the folks on stage, but from the folks in the room was like, hey, for five years, for 10 years, we felt that moving back meant uh, taking a step back in our career. Right. But now you see people moving back and join Gojek. One of the guys I spoke on stage there was a machine learning specialist at, uh, at Amazon and Walmart Labs. And he now works for one of our portfolio companies. So you're starting to see that dynamic. So we're not there yet but it's, it's moving in, in the positive direction. But again, talent and, and hiring is, is, is the main thing uh, from an engineering point of view. Right, so uh, anything to add? No, I think in every market evolution, uh, yeah. it takes time to get all this uh, development. I mean, I, recently I was talking to somebody uh, who spoke to me 10 years ago about China VC market. And they were asking exactly the same question you were asking. Today, nobody asks that question anymore in China, right? All the technology, all the ecosystem all fully developed. Southeast Asia, I think we are in that initial phase. I think uh, I agree with him about the Series B crunch. So those are issues that are facing some of the company, but it will be resolved over time. And uh, all these things about the investor coming from Korea, from Japan, from China, these are all good, thing, all good things. There will be some smart investor, there will be some dumb investor, doesn't matter. Uh, ultimately, uh, this is good for the ecosystem. Uh, some people will make money, some people will lose their pants, some people will lose their shirts, <laughs> doesn't matter. I think that ultimately the ecosystem needs to have all these things going. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, 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 I always mention that the, uh, it's important to have money, but money is not necessarily the only condition. You need knowledge, you need people, you need market, you need execution, you need a lot more things than that. So it takes time to get there, but it cannot happen overnight. Yeah, so right now it seems, uh, as Peter mentioned, that the talents moving back or, or moving to Singapore, right? And, and 
uh, kind of stirring the pot a little to, to create uh, this concentration of talent that perhaps one day can, can rival uh, Silicon Valley or China in terms of just concentration of talent? Uh, do you see that being uh, possible within the next, I don't know, five no, five years. I think it's it's already happening, and, yeah. it's, and you said to Singapore, it's not just to Singapore, it's yeah. to to to, yeah. to the region. Like uh, one of our portfolio companies, um, Tokopedia in Indonesia, uh, we were very active in in helping them find their VP of engineering, who's made a massive difference, the VP of product, who are both very coveted individuals, professionals in in India. Uh, we work very closely with with Tokopedia, uh, sorry, with uh, Gojek on their tech. And, and, and help them turn things around and connected them with certain capabilities in India and then help them actually acquire some of those companies. Okay. Um, so there's now a bunch of Indian engineers working in, uh, in Jakarta and, and they have an engineering hub in, uh, in Bangalore. Right. Uh, and there's even folks from the US now seeing the scale that some of those companies have and, and showing an interest in the region and moving over. So it is, it is happening already. Can I just comment on scale, right? Because one of the things is because NSI is a Southeast Asian focused Fund. So a lot of our investors ask us, what's the market opportunity of Southeast Asia, right? So we start with Tomasic and Google report saying that it's a $200 billion market. Actually, we went and we said it's a $300 billion market because uh, they didn't include the tertiary services like health tech, fintech, edutech, all these things, right? So we, you must realize that Indonesia was at 20% penetration for internet when we started the firm two and a half years ago. Today, it's at 47%. It's expected to go to 60%. The speed at which the internet has penetrated these services, sorry, these economies, means that there's nothing to disrupt. I always tell people we're not disrupting industries. We're just creating whole industries. When doctors can't even talk to patients in a third tier city in Indonesia, and we roll out um, you know, an application with one of our portfolio companies like M Health Tech, so that specialists can see through the camera uh, skin conditions. That's not disrupting anything. We're just creating that. And uh, what we tell a lot of people is that the value creation per user in these markets are going to get very big. So, like Topica, uh, no, like you look at Facebook, who famously says they capture like twenty dollars a user. Topica, if you sell an English online learning course in Vietnam, is four hundred dollars plus per user. So you can make very big revenue businesses not having to have global domination, but it means that you got to be very good at your execution and you got to be very Vietnamese. And then when you move into Thailand, you better be very Thai. So I think we're functioning as a firm to make sure that happens. And if we achieve that, we're going to get $500 million companies, a billion dollar companies. So we believe that Gojek and Grab and Garena, this is just the cusp. And in fact, horizontal is just the cusp of what this region can actually deliver because there's nothing to disrupt. We're just building actual tertiary services over a new distribution mechanism called the smartphone. I guess it's interesting you mentioned creating value for users in places like Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, where you know, they're kind of trying to catch up in some ways. Um, monetization, is it going to be a problem? Because uh, while you're creating value for these people, right, introducing new services, yeah, you know, so do they like, have the pockets. I famously came things, from the yeah. media business. I would never necessarily invest in an OTT business yeah. because the piracy is so great. So there are structural issues that you have to worry about. But you know, like if you actually can deliver a service that is valuable, people will pay, especially if it's in the if it's cheaper than in the real world. Or if you don't even have the ability to get a credit card because no bank wants to give you a credit card and you put that service out there monetization is going to happen because you're the only thing out there and it's fair, right? You, you're charging a fair price. So I think if you do the transfer pricing from the developed market to try and come here and you don't reduce your pricing, you're going to run into monetization issues. Mm -hmm. But last I checked, a lot of these companies don't have monetization issues because they're tailor-making their products at the price point and at a service delivery that's fit for that geography or country. Yeah, so what, what, what seems, what um, the, the consensus seems to be is that in, in a sense, Southeast Asia is, is in some ways self-contained that if you can make it big in, in one of these countries, say Vietnam, and really dominate the market, that's a huge opportunity. So uh, where do you see kind of Southeast Asia? I, I, sorry, I, yeah. I, I still challenge that to some extent. Yeah. It depends what your definition of scale is. Right. Um, like Carousel uh, was a phenomenal company. Uh, these guys were the first. We got in quite quickly after that. 
Um, if they had just dominated Singapore, it would have been a nice business, but not a fantastic business. Yeah. Um, when their international expansion started to kick in, that's when you really could start seeing a very, very valuable company, even though they're you know, not necessarily monetized yet, but still a very valuable company already. Um, it, it depends what your definition is. If you're a seed fund and you invest whatever, a million dollars, and you can see a $30 million outcome, that might be nice. Yeah. For uh, a larger fund, uh, Vertex or ourselves, um, that might not be sufficient. Um, and hence, if we look at the market, we're basically saying that in, in all markets in Southeast Asia, except for Indonesia, it is very tough to build a domestic business that could hit the scale that we would like to see. Um, and in Indonesia, it can only happen in certain verticals, like, like obviously Tokopedia as the horizontal marketplace. Yeah. Uh, Tokopedia, uh, Gojek being in so many different uh, aspects. For all other businesses, yeah. being very deeply Thai and just being in Thailand, you might, again, build a nice business, but not a very large business. Right. So we actually like the fact that companies in our portfolio, like 90 Seconds, you know, already have offices in, in London, in the US, in, in Japan, in, in Australia, et cetera. Uh, guys like Nugget, which is homegrown in Singapore, but their largest customer is actually in Menlo Park, uh, Facebook. Uh, the fact that they start seeing global traction and start, start showing that they can actually drive revenues from a global market rather than just one country in Southeast Asia or even all of Southeast and, Asia is actually and a Can good I thing. just add, once you build a regional business, you're very interesting as either an investment or, or an M&A because it's really hard. So that um, so-called negative to us is actually a positive because... Um, you know, you become a very rare or very precious good, um, and people want to either you know partner with you or or buy you. Yeah, but I, I think yeah. the the fact remains is that Southeast Asia actually is a very uh, fragmented market. That one we have to recognize. I think I think uh, we are not China, we're not U.S. A single uniform market. Uh, so we have to recognize that. I think one of the key points I think many panelists are saying is that uh, the company had to pick the market they want to start with, execute well in the market and roll out over time beyond their whatever the home market they may develop. I think the key issue is you have to pick the right market first to start. Whether it's Carousel, whether it's Garena, whatever market, you have to pick the right market to start with and then roll out over the region. But each market is different, language is different, law is different, religion is different, even you know, the way they, they, they execute the plan is different. So they have to recognize the, the differentiations. Yeah, so it's, it sounds like the, the regional so-called fragmentation is actually an advantage if you're able to build a playbook and successfully expand and dominate the different markets. And it's very hard for someone to come in, right? Just like it's hard for someone to go into China and, and defeat the, the equality, right? So it sounds like, yeah, de developing this regional playbook is, is critical, especially if you're a horizontal. I mean, also, I want to, I want to, I want to bend, uh, like, uh, lean heavily on the fact that there has to be also a right fit between the founder and the investor, because this is happening a lot in LATAM and some of the other developing markets where the the fundamental relationship between the LP and the and the investors are changing, whereby they are starting to allow smaller return ratios to actually occur from larger VC firms. So, right. for example, you know, you, we, would, we would all look at the VC as a oh, 100x return, and the other is like 90% failing. There's a lot of VCs coming out these days in relation to corporate venture capital firms uh, and, uh, and, and private equity, equity firms. Yeah, yeah, well, not pretending, trying their best, come on. Just, there's a lot of private equity people here, I think, also. But, but also for the fact that they're, they're, the relationship, stabilizing that LP to, 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 to investor relationship also helps founders find the right match so that it doesn't have to be a regional playbook that makes you a unicorn. That's great for me as a VC, but also there will be more and more VCs that are tailored to meaningful returns, as in maybe a three to four X return that right. still develops a win-win a for the, yeah. the, 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 the raft of the actual stakeholders. But I agree, at least for us, we believe that you gotta get regional. And so uh, we want people, you know, our, we've structured our fund to help the companies we've invested in to actually do that. So that's why operational support is very important. But the founder must also feel like we're not, you know, meddling. And so that's a very gentle balance that you have to do as an ex-entrepreneur and, and now uh, an investor. But if you do it properly, you know, we can make a phenomenally large business regionally in Southeast Asia. Yeah, make a lot of money. So yeah, that's all the time we have. Uh, please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>